views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. All right, coming up on this edition of today's verdict, state and federal officials have always wielded considerable power. But when someone acts outside the scope of their responsibilities, it is important to call them to task. On this edition of today's verdict, we will let you know what legal remedies you have when a governmental official has done you wrong. Later, the New York City Bar Association equips and mobilizes the legal profession to practice with excellence. How do they do that, and how can you reach out to them for guidance? Stay tuned for a discussion with the two directors from the organization. As you can see, we have much to get to, so stay tuned. Today's verdict starts right now. All right, hello and welcome to today's verdict, the live and interactive show that gives you your legal rights and options. I'm your host and trial attorney, David Lesh. Well, today's verdict is always encouraging you to stay connected. Make sure to tweet us at today's verdict and hashtag ask today's verdict if you have a question. Also, make sure to like us and follow us at Facebook at today's verdict and check us out at bronxnet.tv. Keeping our governmental officials from abusing the power given to them by the Constitution is no easy task. Luckily for us, we have attorney Jacques Simone on set to help us ready the battle. Jacques, hi, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Been very much looking forward to it. Um, by the way, let's start off. When we're talking about governmental officials at this point, specifically with you and your practice, we're really talking with officials who may be looking at the health care sector. Am I correct? Correct. Tom, yes. give me an yes, example, David. if you could. For example, the FDA, the DEA, state medical boards uh, in New York, the Office uh, of Professional Medical Conduct, other states, Departments of Health, U.S. Department of Health, that's what we're All right. so discussing. I'm a physician, let's say, and um, I get a letter or something in the mail that's telling me uh, that there's something that's not correct and there's been some type of complaint. Um, what do I do? What am I supposed to do? Is this usually how it works? Uh, yes. Uh, the first initiation, initiation of contact with state and federal officials could be dual. You either get the letter or you get the in-person visit. And when you get an in-person visit, that's not pleasant because uh, they can come with guns and they can come with subpoenas, passing them off for warrants, which is illegal. Uh, and, and they can effectuate the whole search of your premises, taking medical records okay, off. Okay, let's, let's start with the letter, right? Yes. What does the letter usually say? And Because obviously it's going to give the doctor a few sleepless nights. What does it usually entail? Well, usually the letter is supposed to tell you that there is a complaint. Okay. Uh, it doesn't have to identify who the complainant is, but it has to identify the issues of the complaint. And it requests the medical record for the particular patient that the complaint is about. Uh, in New York, they sort of did away with that. What, what types of complaints are or do you usually see more often than not? Um, is it, uh, re is it you know, records that are, that are possibly not maintained? What types of issues are the doctors being called to task for? Well, the, the complaints can come from different sources. They can come from a divorced parent who is unhappy with the treatment that the uh, uh, non-custodial child is getting. Uh, and he's trying to get back to the other parent. It can come from a, an emergency room physician who got a patient that was in the care of a certain doctor and the patient developed medical problems as a result of the medical uh, uh, care that he, he or she received from the doctor. Okay, now backing up for a second, by the way, is this an administrative process? Uh, does this involve the, the courts, state, federal, both, something else? It depends. I, I like to involve the state and the federal courts. Uh, but uh, necessarily the uh, disciplinary process, the medical disciplinary process, is an administrative process. All right. And is, do you have to go through the administrative process fully before involving a, a federal judge or a state judge? It depends what the issues are. Uh, okay. For example, if there is a random request for medical record without identifying what the issue is, Medical records, med medical record demand has, have to be relevant to the issue of the investigation. If they don't identify what the issue of the investigation is and they issue a subpoena, 
then I get to get to a judge challenging the subpoena. You know, then I, now I know in the legal profession, uh, if, you, if there is some type of investigation, sometime the disciplinary committee will look for more than just the complaint itself. They'll broaden and look for, it could be escrow funds, it could be anything that they, that they want to. Is that the way this works as well in the, uh, in, the, in the medical field? Well, that is correct. So what happens, let's say, for example, there's a complaint about one particular patient. And then the board wants to, or, or the investigators want to broaden the investigation. So instead of asking for the medical record of one particular patient, they say, we want five, med five random medical records that you gave similar treatment to other patients. That is not part of the complaint. Is that allowed? That, that is not allowed, and that is where I challenge, that's where the court challenges come in. Because broadening the investigation without any reason it's not relevant to the initial inquiry. Now, uh, talking about sleepless nights, is there a certain amount of time that these licensing or these boards have to, to bring a, a suit or to, or to commence a proceeding, or to, is this last indefinitely? Uh, unfortunately, New York lasts indefinitely. Other states, they have statutes of limitations. California has a three-year statute of limitations. But not example. New York. Not New York. In New York, you can get prosecuted indefinitely. Any particular reason why? The legislature just didn't pass a statute of limitations. They're looking at it right now. Okay, so now, and I would assume the best advice you can give to a doctor or a physician or somebody who gets this letter or somebody barges in is to contact, obviously, you pretty quickly. What do you do once you realize, wow, okay, I, I, this is something that uh, I have to deal with? Well, it is very interesting because, like, if I get it in New York, there's a major legal issue that's going to come up. Uh, because uh, the New York OPMC is now bypassing the uh, constitutional requirements of Levin versus Muraski, which was a case of the Court of Appeals back in 1983 that said, no agency shall inquire in the general practice of medicine or in the general business of a, of a physician in the hopes that they're going to find a violation of the law. A little fishing expedition. Correct. So what they're doing now is they're bypassing the subpoena. They're sending a letter out saying, we want the medical record, and if you don't respond within 30 days, we will discipline you. There is no judicial review for this. It's now constructive search. Right. There's no judicial review in the scheme for this constructive search. That's about to get challenged. Okay, so now you're obviously moving it into the, the court um, arena at this point. Do you put it into the state court, federal court, and why would you pick one as opposed to the other? That depends. Uh, everybody thinks that the federal government can tell the state government what to do. That is not true. Uh, uh, Younger versus higher substantial doctrine does not allow federal courts to touch administrative actions in, in progress unless there is a bad faith prosecution. What is a bad faith prosecution? A bad faith prosecution is a prosecution brought to either stifle the exercise of a constitutional right, such as First Amendment, a doctor writes a paper about something. Yeah, we were talking a little bit about that uh, yes. off air. Give me an example. You were telling me recently about um, a doctor who, who just wrote a report, or, or wrote a paper or a report and not necessarily treating anybody, and yet they were brought up on some type of disciplinary charges. Correct. What happened was he put, uh, he put up the... Uh, uh, the, 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 the paper that he wrote, and the prosecutor says, well, this must be because you're treating patients like this. We're going to bring charges against you. That is a, a, an example of a bad faith prosecution to intimidate and harass the exercise of First Amendment rights. Now, from where I'm sitting, and I, and I know that I see this sometimes with clients in, in that come into my office, you sometimes become a target, certainly of the police, for example. You know, if you're picked up once on the street, you tend to get picked up more often um, just because they, they're, they're familiar with you. Does this happen with respect to the medical field? Do you find certain doctors are getting these over and over again? Are they targeted? Uh, that is a good question, and, and the answer is yes, depending on what it is that the practice, the practice is. The more cutting edge the practice, the more they're going to get targeted. For example, the segment treating Lyme disease with long-term antibiotics has long been a favorite target of, of medical boards countrywide. They still are, uh, Why those is physicians. Uh, you have two different... Uh, views uh, on how to treat Lyme disease? Correct. Okay. You have two different I mean, views on how to treat Lyme disease. One is the Infectious Disease Society of America that says nothing past 30 days of antibiotics is good. It's not going to do anything. You can be as sick as a dog. It doesn't matter. It's not going to help. Then you have the uh, international... Lyme and Associated Diseases Society that says, no, Lyme disease is a chronic disease. You should treat with longer than 30-day uh, re regimes of antibiotics. 
and Lyme disease is, comes in different forms and it can diagnose in different by different methodology. The guys who don't believe in that are getting into the boards to prosecute the guys. Ah, who do. Gotcha. You have a lot of antitrust issues with that as well as a lot of bad faith prosecution. Okay. Let's fast forward it now. Now we're hopefully you're in the um, you passed the discovery issue and you're really trying to negotiate, I hope a settlement for the doctor who doesn't want to lose their license. How does that work? By the way? Well, it, that depends. In the administrative forum, there is not much of a of a leverage. So usually, what happens, my the doctors that I represent wind up in court one way or another. So uh, what happens invariably is a lot of attorneys are involved. When you put the case into court, the administrative prosecutors are no longer involved. Now you get the state attorney general involved okay. in most states. So it's, it's a different type of an animal. So everybody gets involved to bring about a, a some sort of a settlement. And what are the, what, what's on the table usually? Uh, Suspensions? Uh, what, what's there? Revocation, suspension, okay. restriction. Uh, everything is on the table. And I know that this may be a, a tough question for you to answer, but do you have um, a trend that seems to be being followed? Are most doctors allowed to kind of keep their license or is it a case by case? I mean, what do you... It's a case by case. Uh, I, knock on wood, I have success uh, because I'm realistic in how it is that I approach these cases. I respect my state and federal official colleagues okay. and they, they do give me good references. Okay, and the doctors, I hope, listen to you and if they're your, uh, your, their cl your clients. I hope sometimes, sometimes they do. Right? Sometimes they do, yes. Any tips you would give to a physician who's watching right now who thinks that they're about to have a problem with the licensing board, what would you say to them? Well, I would say, I would say to them not to interface personally because that is when the problems start. The physician thinks they're going to save money by responding to that first letter by themselves. And that's where they get into trouble because they give more information to the board to investigate. Almost acting as if they're their own attorney. Correct. Right? Um, okay. Finding you, by the way, because I have a few more questions, but before we do, before I get to that, I want to make sure we know where to get you. What's some contact information? Uh, I have my email address is jgs at jacksimon.com. Okay. You can find me at jacksimon.com on the web and my phone number. I have 2-212-906-9077 and 516-378-8400. Okay. Um, let's get back. Is it just physicians? Are there also... Um, nurses that you may deal with, or is it just really the, the doctors themselves? I don't only represent doctors. I represent chiropractors. I represent okay. uh, I represent dentists. I represented uh, uh, nurse, uh, nurse practitioners. Nurse practitioners yes. as well? Or, and physician assistants. All right. Um, final thoughts that you want to, I mean, do, does it look like this is being taken seriously uh, by the judges? Are they, are they moving these cases along? I mean, because you, it is true you know, this is, this is your livelihood as, as a doctor, and to know that it's hanging over your head because one of these agencies decides to, you know, throw a complaint at you, you know, it could be very difficult. Yeah, and, it, and again, it's not only the state medical boards that, that do that. You can have the FDA, you can have the DEA. Uh, I had an illegal search and seizure actually down in Texas where they came with a subpoena and they seized, the DEA seized 324 medical records to start a criminal case, and I said, where's the warrant? And they just went and did it. And they, they didn't have a warrant. I said, can I have my toys back, please? And they had you to give them back. back. All right, well, um, speaking of coming back, will you come back? I certainly will. Thank you All for right. inviting well, me. Uh, Jacques, it's been a pleasure. But we have to take a quick break. But don't worry, we'll be back with more Today's Verdict right after this. How can I help my daughter with her reading? Searching for help with Dachshund reading. No. <laughs> Let me try. Sarah's bright, but when she's reading, she has trouble sounding out words. Playing world music. What? I give up. Wait, I was trying to show you how Sarah feels every day. Frustrating, isn't it? Redirecting to understood.org. Join parents and experts at understood.org, a free online resource about learning and attention issues to help your child thrive.
our neighbors and best friends. I love my sister. My heart, my heart doesn't, doesn't see race. race. Love, love is love. love. Our family is no less than any other family. Welcome back to Today's Verdict. I am your host, David Lesh. We are always encouraging you to stay connected. Tweet us at Today's Verdict. The New York City Bar Association is an association that helps lawyers and law students improve their legal profession, promote reform of the law, and, up, up, and uphold the rule of law. Joining us today is the Executive Director, Brett Parker, and Associate Director of Advocacy, Elizabeth Kosienda. Thank you both for being here. Thanks, Thanks for having us. us. All right, um, Brett, I'm a little familiar with the, um, with the organization. Uh, but my viewers are not. So tell us a little bit about what the organization does. Okay. Sure, the New York City Bar is an organization of 24,000 lawyers, law students, and, and other uh, uh, legal professionals. And uh, a lot of what we do is to help the profession. A lot of what we do is to help the public. Um, uh, one of the big things that we do is to help uh, members of the public find a lawyer. They have a legal issue. Um, they don't know where, who to call or, or where to reach out. And, and if they go to our website, we have, a, we have tools to help them reach a panel of lawyers who we vet and screen and uh, have uh, experience in a variety of areas. Okay, well, let's, I'm a little familiar with it because I'm actually on the panel and I have been referred cases. But if I was, let's say, a viewer and I had an issue, um, how does it get to you? Is it, uh, do I show up at a door? Do I call? Three, tell me how that happened. Great question. So the, the main thing people want to do is, is first of all, our website is nycbar.org. And on there, there's a, there's a box that says, find a lawyer. And right there, it tells you how to reach us by email, by phone. There's a variety of ways, but the website will help you get there. And then you, you call us up, and we have, a, we have actually a panel of lawyers on our staff who will listen to you for a few minutes and, and talk through your issue and figure out, is there someone on our panel of 400 lawyers where they can direct you? And that and, doesn't cost anything. And how do, you find, how do you find these attorneys? Well, we screen uh, members, of the, uh, you know, members of the bar who, are, who are, uh, have experience in a variety of areas. And so we're out there. We're interviewing them. We check references. We make sure they're admitted to the bar. Um, as I said, we have about 400 of them in a variety of areas, and, and we screen them. Now, now, once you send it to an attorney, an attorney starts working on the case, do you still monitor that particular case, or do you let the, uh, the lawyer kind of just go with it for a little while? No, no, these, these lawyers run with the case. I mean, uh, we, 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 uh, we, give the, the, we refer the cases to lawyers who have experience in this area. We check back later in the process, but, but these, these cases are handled by the lawyers we send them to. Uh, okay, uh, Elizabeth, let's, uh, let's change um, tunes here a little bit. Your role a little bit with the organization. Tell us about it. Sure. So the City Bar, one of the benefits that we have for our members is we have 160 different committees that cover pretty much every area of law from animals to zoning. We have a committee that will handle that. Um, so what our office does is we help facilitate our committees taking policy to positions, speaking out on issues that are of interest to them and to their clients and their practice. So um, committees can do that in a lot of different ways. They can issue reports on legislation. They can draft legislation. They can do amicus briefs. They can write to elected officials. It really runs the gamut depending on what the committee's interest is. And how do you become part of the committee? Do you join the organization? In a, is, there a, is there a vote, a proxy? How does it work? So um, we, you, you have to be a member of the city bar, and we have um, every year we have op open opportunities for members to join um, their there's an application process. We have committee chairs that serve for three-year terms, and they get to pick who's on the committee. But we also have staff that help facilitate that process for them. Now you had mentioned Albany, or yes. at least you had mentioned that there's, you know, certain uh, issues that you feel even more uh, um, concerned about. What are some of the issues that the bar, the bar Association right now is looking at? So this year, two of our top agenda items are election reform and criminal justice reform, particularly early voting and uh, bail reform. So those are two areas where we see a lot of room for growth in New York. Um, and it, when it comes to election law, New York is, has an abysmal <laughs> return when it comes to um, participation in our elections. In 2016, even with two New Yorkers on top of the ticket, we, only, we were 41st in the country when it came to voter Why turnout. Why do you think that is? 
I think it's a lot of things. I think um, from our perspective, the, the system is, is difficult. We have one day that you can vote every year. It's during the week. People have work. Um, and depending on where you are in the state depends on how long your polling place is even open. So while in the city we might have some extra hours if you're upstate or on Long Island, sometimes those hours may vary. So if you're a person who has caregiver responsibilities, if you're working, if you just have bad transportation that day, the subway breaks down, it might prevent you from coming in. Exactly. All right, uh, Brett, um, getting back to you know finding an attorney, which is so important, uh, certainly to the, to the viewers in the Bronx, this, I know this is also shown in Manhattan, um, do you find that there's a frustration in the community in terms of the legal expertise they're getting. Do you do, they, do you find that some of the people, you know, that you're that you hear from the the phone calls that you get, um, suggest that, you know, just people want, they need help and they want somebody to help them. Do you find that? Yeah, I don't know if I would call it frustration so much as as they're just not sure where to reach out to and and because there's so many places where you can find lawyers and 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 some are are you know more reliable than others. And what the New York City Bar does is give them a reliable, trusted source for those lawyers. What types of trends do you see? Is it, is it issues of immigration, um, accident types of issues, like medical malpractice? We were just talking about licensing and, and um, doctors before we got on. Um, criminal DWIs. What, what do you? Where do you see? see that the calls are coming more often than not, really? Yeah, I mean, we, we see it from, from those areas and a lot of others. I mean, you mentioned immigration. So, for example, uh, in addition to this legal referral service hotline, we actually also have a pro bono arm of the New York City Bar, the City Bar Justice Center. And we have an immigration project that helps uh, 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 people who can't afford a lawyer who, or who have an, a question about an immigration status where they can call up, again, our legal hotline and, and get some help you know, with politically, that. politically, this is such a tough thing to do now to be dealing with the immigration area because you don't know who's, you know, who may be called in and whatever. Do you guarantee or do you try and protect those who come into you and whether they're trying to become a citizen, get a green card? How does that work? Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, when when uh, when one of our pro bono lawyers or one of our panel lawyers are representing someone, um, they, you know, they do the best that they can. There are no guarantees, uh, so 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 obviously we can't promise that. Um, but our lawyers, both the the pro bono lawyers and the staff lawyers at the project and the and the legal first lawyers, they all take their commitment to their clients very seriously. Okay. Um, Elizabeth, we had somebody uh, on the on the show not too long ago discussing bail reform. Mm -hmm. um, and how important it is, most people don't have the money to pay for the bail, and they end up just sitting for crimes that they didn't do, and they'll just plead to it because they just want to get out quicker than possible. Tell me what your experience is with the bail reform issues. So our biggest thing when it comes to bail reform is that freedom before trial should be the norm, as opposed to the exception, which seems to be the case for a lot of people now. And it really has become a system where we have this two-tiered criminal justice system where if you have the money, you're able to walk out of jail that day or the next day. Um, and if you don't have enough money, you're sitting, you know, in Rikers Island or wherever you're being incarcerated. Um, and it's the system is just not supposed to work that way. It's not supposed to be how much money you have. Well, what would you suggest? What does the organization suggest? How's that? So um, the city bar supports the elimination of cash bail for misdemeanor and felony offense, uh, nonviolent felony offenses. Um, we also support um, the elimination of the commercial bail bond industry to kind of remove that for-profit incentive that currently exists now for people um, to keep people in jail. Um, Brett, lectures. Let's talk about what's going on. Um, I, I know you always have things that you're, pro that you're promoting. What do you have on the agenda coming up? Anything that you want to talk about? I mean, that's a softball question. I know. Because, <laughs> because, because right on, right on, any, on any given day... Uh, you have probably like, uh, God knows how many. So um, uh, I happen to know in a couple weeks Jeffrey Tubin is going to come sure. and speak, oh, speak, nice. speak at the New York City Bar. Um, a, a, the month after that, uh, Justice Ginsburg is coming for her annual lecture where oh, she, she, she comes and talks to people and, and brings a lecture. And, and that's just two off the top of Which, my head. Which, by the way, how do you become a member of the organization, by the way? So uh, as Linda said, uh, if, you're, if you're admitted, you can become a, a, a member of the organization. And actually, you can be admitted anywhere in the, in the country. Um, or anywhere in the world. We have members from, from uh, over 50 countries. And if you're admitted to be a lawyer, uh, you fill out some paperwork uh, and pay a fee, and you're a member of the New York City Bar Association. Um, this is another tough question for you. I mean, this isn't a softball one. Um, there are, again, certain areas in terms of lecturing, you know, whether it's bullying in, in, school, in schools. Is there, is there any controversial subject, really controversial subjects that you find are coming through the doors that... You know, it's hard for you to take one particular stance on. We we actually have that that problem frequently. Our committees, which which are where we take stances on on positions, 
we, our committees are made up of people with various viewpoints. We have prosecutors and defense attorneys on the same committee in the same room trying to agree on a position. And, and the benefit of that is if they do manage to agree on a position, it's already thought out and, and, and has different perspectives, and we can reach conclusions. You can. Is it, is it, is it, by the way, is this taped? Do you, do you tape some of the lectures so you can watch it online, or is it, or is it basically you have to go to the lecture? No, as a matter of fact, we have, we have a lot of our, our programs, both video and, and audio online. We actually just launched our first podcast, and we did one on guns and the law, which is just went up on our website oh. uh, yesterday, and it's, it's a fascinating short podcast where you can listen about those issues. Elizabeth, um, finally, getting back to Albany, mm -hmm. What's coming up? Is, I, I understand that you got some big, um, some some big votes coming yeah, up. Yeah. Right? So the, um, as of this taping, the, they're currently negotiating the budget. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the it seems at the moment a lot of the substantive issues that we were supporting, like I mentioned, early voting, bail reform, being two of them, fell out of the budget. The governor had put them in there. Um, but at this point now, there's a remainder session where we're really looking forward to working on those. There's a lot of issues still at stake. The legislature is in, in session until June. Um, so there's still a lot of time to and get this will be airing done. in a couple of days. So mm -hmm. by the time it airs, we'll know exactly what well, the situation is. Well, hopefully. We'll see. You never and know. you're going to come back, <laughs> yes. and you're going to give us a little update. Um, finally, where do we reach you? How do we find you? Sure. Here, give it to us, please. So nycbar.org is, is, is where you can find us. And there's a box that says find a lawyer. We, uh, we have translators, so we, we, we have people who speak a variety of languages. And uh, you can reach us by, by the website. And the best or you could advise, advice you could give to a non-lawyer right now watching, what would you say? Uh, if you're a non-lawyer watching, don't try to represent yourself. Uh, you know what they say about, about representing yourself. That's right. So. <laughs> Call the client to call you, right? Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you very much. All right. Well, that's all the time we have for today. I'd like to thank our guests for joining us and, of course, you, the viewers, for watching. If you missed any part of today's show, be sure to check it out at www.bronxit.tv. Also remember, if there is a legal issue or topic you'd like to see on a future edition of Today's Verdict, feel free to contact me at davidlesh at bronxit.org or tweet us at Today's Verdict, and make sure to hashtag Ask Today's Verdict if you have any issues. For myself and all of us at Today's Verdict, always remember, know your rights, know your issues, reach a verdict. We'll see you next time. They said I have troll teeth. That my voice sounded like a possessed baby doll. That no one would ever love someone as stupid as me. That I was fat. Ugly. Disgusting. The effect of bullying is potent. We will no longer be the silent majority. Now, when you see online bullying, there's something you can do about it. We're going to take action with the eye. I am a witness. I am a witness. I am a witness. I am a witness. I am a witness, and so are you. So, I'm kind of new here, but I've noticed a trend. My human does this funny thing where she goes around and gets all my toys, and then she hides them in that basket by the door. You know, but it's always the same basket, and it's always in the, in the same place. And then she acts so surprised when I find them, but, you know, she's putting them in the same basket. Again. It's like, hello? That's where you put it last time. You were the worst at hide-and-go-seek.